Our text this morning is Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 32. These are the words of God. And he went, he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. And he could, do, and he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went round about the villages teaching. And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits, and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no scrip, no bread, no money in their purse, but, he, but be shod with sandals, and not put on two coats. And he said unto them, In what place soever ye enter into an house, there abide till ye depart from the, that place. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when you depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. And King Herod heard of him, for his name was spread abroad. And he said, that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Others said, that is Elias, and others said, that, is, that it is a prophet, or as one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, it is John, whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have, him, and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and unholy, and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. And when a convenient day was come that Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains, and chief estates of Galilee, and when the daughter of the, of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. And he sware unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee, unto the half of my kingdom. And she went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in straightway with haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger, the head of John the Baptist. And the king was exceeding sorry, yet for his oath's sake and for their sakes, which sat with him, he would not reject her. And immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought, and he went and beheaded him in the prison, and brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel, and the damsel gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. Let's pray. Our good and gracious Father, we thank you for the power of your word. And we know that you have backed up the power of your word by raising your son from the dead, uh, conquering uh, sin, the devil, the world, by his great power, by his resurrection. We pray now that by the preaching of your word, accompanied with the power of your spirit, we pray that you would make us live, that where there are dry bones, they would live. Where there is parched hearts, I pray that you would bring the water of your life. Where there is good soil, I pray that your seed would go in and bear a great harvest. We pray all of this in the mighty name of Jesus, and amen. amen. It doesn't take long in a child's life for them to begin waxing eloquent and expounding on matters of justice. That's not fair, a child might shout. But it's learned early. I remember playing Monopoly with my cousin once, and she confided in us that 
Uh, she was in the habit, and we were never sure if she had played this trick on us, but she was in the habit of before playing Monopoly, she would sneak a few dollar bills and hide them in the bathroom, and then during the course of the game, sneak off to the bathroom and suddenly come back with a little bit more cash on hand. And us children learn to say, that's not fair. It's learned early on. And indeed, the world is littered with seemingly senseless instances of unjust suffering, evil persecution of the righteous, and unfair weights and measures. We can look around us at the powerful and the, and the prestigious, and as, as we see uh, uh, celebrities and, and uh, politicians misusing and abusing their power, we've seen it in, in churches, we've seen it in every institution, of the, the, the persecution of the righteous by the evil, the unjust weights and measures. And we might scratch our heads and say, that's not fair, what's to be done? The question, oftentimes in matters of morality, that, that is raised by ob objections to uh, the word of God, objectors, uh, antagonists to uh, God and the gospel, the question is asked, what is God going to do about all the uh, perceived unfairness, all the injustices, all the evil that's done to the innocent. The question must be asked, what is God going to do about it? As we've been working through the gospel of Mark, I, I have the, I, I, I get to chart out the preaching schedule, and as I was looking at the, the uh, progression through Mark's gospel, um, I was happy to find that this text landed on Easter Sunday. It's quite the unsurprising, or surprising yet very fitting uh, text for Easter morning. Uh, and and this, this passage answers that question of what is God going to do about evil? What is God going to do about unfairness, injustice, wrong? How is he going to make all the wrongs right? And the resurrection is, in fact, to anticipate the, the rest of this message, the, the resurrection is, in fact, the answer to all the injustices. And this text highlights the fact that Christ's resurrection is the vindication of God's righteousness, God's justice. And so I want to walk through this, this text, um, surveying it, looking at, at the, the, the various details of it, and then I want to make a few pointed observations about what, um, how this applies to us, especially in light of it being Easter morning. The residents of Jesus' hometown demonstrate themselves as Jesus returns to his hometown. He, he goes and he's teaching and, and, and teaching on the Sabbath day in the synagogue. Um, he dem he, they demonstrate themselves to be the sort of unfruitful soil which he described er in his earlier parable. Remember the, the parable of the four soil types. These are the sort that hear it and reject it. They too, like we heard last week in the residence of the Decapolis, they see the great wonder and the great teaching of Messiah, of, um, of Jesus, and, and instead of receiving it with joy, they reject it. The, the cares of this life crowd it out. They too, like the residents of Decapolis, they are astonished at Jesus' teaching, but instead of receiving it gladly, they reject it, verses 1 through 3. Meanwhile, the multitudes which have been following Jesus around, and we'll see next week in, in the, the feeding of the 5,000, the multitudes continue to swell around Jesus. This mission of bringing the good news of the coming of, God, of Yahweh's kingdom is swelling the ranks of Jesus' followers. This is no uh, small ministry. This is no small following. The, the multitudes are crowding around to hang on Jesus' every word, and upon his very person. Remember, we saw last week how the, the crowd is jostling him and the woman reaches out to, uh, the woman with the internal bleeding reaches out to touch him in the hopes that just touching the, the, the hem of his garment would heal her. And when Jesus turns around and says, who touched, who touched me, who touched my robes and, and the power went out from him. Remember the disciples were, well, everybody, everybody's touching you. It's, it's, a, it's a massive uh, crowd of people uh, going through the streets here. The multitudes are hanging upon Jesus' every word and upon his very person, but the hometown crowd had trouble apprehending that their local carpenter, Mary's boy, that, that he could be a great prophet. I saw him fix my broken door. How could he be a prophet? How could he be the Messiah? The familiarity was a hindrance to their faith. And this lack of faith, Mark tells us, hinders in some way the healing ministry there in their town. His teaching caused them astonishment. 
It's quite the contrast. His teaching caused astonishment in them, while their unbelief, in turn, caused Jesus to marvel. They are astonished at his teaching. He is marveling at their unbelief. Verse 6. Jesus then sends out the twelve in pairs. And this, this concludes the cycle that began with their calling earlier on in the book of Mark. Uh, It's anticipated earlier on, and now we have the culmination of their being sent out. He sends the 12 out in pairs, and according to Luke 10, verse 1, uh, we're told that another 70 are are also sent out with them on this urgent mission, there in verse 7. Their manner of travel was to be marked by swiftness. So this this is an urgent mission. Uh, not, not to be denied. Your, your mission, should you choose to accept it, sort of thing. Go out there and get this mission done. Go spread the, this message of repentance to every corner of Israel. And along with that would come the task of driving out demons and, and, and showcasing the, the power of God to heal the sick, to cleanse the unclean, both in, in spiritually speaking and physically speaking. So they should travel light and not linger in towns that wouldn't hear the sown word, verses 8 through 11. If a town wouldn't hear this good news, if they wouldn't hear this call to repentance, they were to shake the the sand off their their sandals and and not linger any longer. Their task consists of three components. They're to preach repentance, turn from your sins, turn from your sins for Yahweh's kingdom is coming. Yahweh's messianic kingdom had come, verse 12. They are to, secondly, demonstrate this reality of Yahweh's kingdom coming by driving out demons from Israel. We saw last week with the, uh, the, the legion of demons being cast out of the demoniac was a, a, a vibrant de- a demonstration that, that Christ had bound the strong man and the legions of demons, the unclean spirits, were being driven out of Israel. And so the, the, the apostles now are given the same power to drive out Um, unclean spirits. Like David's mighty man, the disciples are now casting out demons from Israel. That's the second component. The third component was this marking of judgment upon the unreceptive, the hard-hearted, those who have crowded out the word and wouldn't receive it, they're to be marked for judgment. And their judgment, we're told, is going to be worse than that of Sodom and Gomorrah's. When they return to Jesus to report how this mission went, they, like Mark's narrative, are breath- breathless. They, Jesus whisked them off again by ship to what is intended to be a bit of a breather. There in verses 30 and 32, we, we have their return, and they're breathless to report uh, all, that was, all that was accomplished by them. And they gather themselves together unto Jesus, and they, they rush forward to tell him all that they had done and all that they had taught. You can imagine 12 plus 70 people trying to come to Jesus and say, and we did this, and this happened, and this person was healed, and this demoniac was delivered. And you can imagine uh, 82 people trying to report the, <laughs> the results of a, of a couple-month-long mission back to Jesus. And he says, let's, let's, let's go off to a, a private place. And we'll see next week that um, this reprieve... Um, is not as much of a reprieve as uh, an advancement of, of, of the spreading and the flourishing of, of the gospel, of, of his kingdom, and the feeding of the 5,000. But as I've noted before, Mark likes to um, sandwich um, a story in between um, two bookends, effectively. So he saw it with the story of uh, Jairus' daughter. The, the, the synagogue ruler comes, pleads for Jesus to um, deliver his daughter from, who's at the point of death, and Jesus agrees, and as he's going, Mark interrupts the story with the story of the woman with the internal ble- bleeding, and then he resolves the story of Jairus' daughter. So he sandwiches um, the, 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 the story that he's wanting to draw our, our, most of our attention to in between a, a, a bookend. And he focuses in that story on the woman's faith, drawing our attention to the sort of faith uh, that, that, um, uh, that God commends, that God finds righteous, that God calls us to have, holding on to Jesus, clinging to Jesus for the, the life-giving power in his name. Well, he's doing something similar here with this retelling of, of the disciples' mission. So he sends them out, and then we are given the report of their their conquest, if you will, of Israel. And in between, we have this grisly story of, of, of uh, John the Baptist beheading. We'll, we'll, so Jesus whisked them off by ship to what is intended to be a bit of a breather, but we'll see that when they arrive, the work will continue, for the seeds of the kingdom are growing rapidly. And we'll see that in the feeding of the 5,000. But in between the disciples going out and coming in, Mark, again, interrupts the narrative with the grisly tale of John the Baptist's martyrdom at the hands of Herod. 
the rumors about the prophet from Nazareth were turning into rumbles. You can imagine that Jesus' ministry starts small and grows. That's one of the things Jesus said in his parables was going to happen. It's a seed that goes into the ground, and it turns into a great mustard tree in which all the birds of heaven might rest in it. That's what Jesus said his kingdom would be like, and it's taking place. It starts out with rumors, but it's turning into rumbles. And this stabs terror into the heart of Herod, and his conclusion is quite remarkable and, again, quite fitting for Easter Sunday. His conclusion to these reports of Jesus' ministry and the reports of the disciples going through Israel, healing the sick, driving out demons, causes Herod to conclude that John the Baptist had been raised from the dead. Verse 14. Others put forward alternate options and opinions as to who, what Jesus' identity was. And I think it's crucial to note that they mention Elijah's, uh, Elijah in the same breath, that they're suggesting that Jesus is Elijah. We know that John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah. And there's quite a bit of parallel between um, Herod and his wife Herodias and Ahab and Jezebel, which we'll get to in a minute, that calls to mind the righteous prophets from of old. So others put forward uh, their opinions as to who Jesus was, but the consensus is that he was a prophet, verse 15. Herod, though, insists upon it being a resurrected John. He says, no, 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 this has got to be John the Baptist risen again. And then we're told a bit of the the details of John's imprisonment. We we know that um, from Mark 1.14, John's imprisonment had been the signal for Jesus to begin his ministry. So now Mark, um, a couple chapters later now, fills in the details of John's martyrdom. Herod had seized John because John had rebuked Herod's adultery with his brother's wife, Herodias. Herod um, was in Rome, and he saw his brother and his brother's wife, and he, he liked her, and he connived his way to separate them and marry her himself, an adulterer. John rebukes it pointedly, uh, the prophet rebuking the the king, the powerful one. Herodias despises John, we're told. She she is um, hell-bent on his destruction, much like Jezebel was uh, for Elijah's. She despises John and is looking for a way, seeking for his death. While Herod respected this pious man and was intrigued, we're told that he, he liked to go and listen to John the Baptist's teaching. He was intrigued by it. He, he wanted to wrap his brain around this, this prophet that was gathering hordes of people around him, in the Jor- baptizing them in the Jordan. And Herod is intrigued by why is this guy gathering a crowd? Herod, we know, uh, uh, wanted the respect and admiration of the Jews. He wanted to be considered a, a lawful king of the Jews. And so he's incredibly intrigued by this pious man, by the righteous man John, and would go out to listen to him. He respected him. He honored him. Nevertheless, during his birthday feast, Herodias' daughter comes and dances so pleasantly for him in the crowd that Herod makes a rash vow, a rash promise. He promises to her up to half of his kingdom. If she would, whatever she asks for, she can get up to half the kingdom. At her mother's council, she straightway asks for John's head on a platter, on a, on a feasting dish, verses 21 through 25. Herod is grieved at this, but not enough aggrieved to break his foolish oath. And he immediately sends the order, gives the order for John's beheading. He gives the head to the daughter who gives it to her mother, quite the grisly picture, uh, a, a mother demanding the life of a godly man. It's, it's quite the inverse of what a mother should be. John's disciples come and bury him in a tomb. Verses 26 through 29. So what I want to point out is that bracketed uh, around this story is this tale of Christ sending out his disciples into all Israel to drive out evil, to drive out uncleanness, and to bring a message of repentance along with a rebuke of judgment coming upon those who will not listen, who will not receive. And in the center of it is this story of a fearful tyrant, a fearful king, a king haunted by the specter of a righteous man coming back from the dead. That's, that's, the, that's what Mark wants to draw our attention to, is a, a wicked king, an unlawful king, being haunted by the prospect of a righteous man being re- returning from the dead. We've seen a couple of times how Mark is giving us hints and clues as, as to what Jesus' life 
how it will end, how Jesus' story will end, where Jesus is heading. He's anticipating the crucifixion and the resurrection and the Great Commission. And we've seen that a number of times. I'll, I'll just recall to you now the Jesus in the tombs with the demoniac is a depiction of where Jesus will, one, will soon be, stripped bare, naked, raving to the heavens, um, oh my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's followed, of course, by the story of the, the raising of Jairus' daughter and the restoring of the woman with the internal bleeding, a resurrection of sorts. Remember, too, that the, the, demo, the demoniac who was delivered was sent back to his town to spread the word, and it's a sort of great commission. Now we have, in the sending out of the 12 apostles, we have a glimpse of what's going to come after the resurrection. So we've just had a resurrection in, in Jairus' daughter, followed by a feast, followed by the sending out of the 12 apostles. So it's, it's foreshadowing what's going to happen in Jesus' own life and ministry. We're, we're being a, a, given a clue as to how this all will end. The disciples' mission anticipates that Jesus will send them out into the whole world to to do the same thing after his resurrection, to carry on the mission not just to the edges of the border of Israel, but into the whole world. Their mission will still consist of a call to repentance, the call to expel evil in exorcisms and healings, and a warning of judgment upon the unrepentant. And Sodom will have it better off than those who reject this kingdom message. And so what Jesus is doing in Israel is about to invade the whole world. And Mark decides to put in between this bracket, this story of a, of a haunted king. Word of this mission and the success of the disciples' work of spreading the gospel and gathering this crowd to come and hear and heed the coming of Yahweh in the flesh in the person of Jesus. Word of this mission and the success of it gets back to Herod. He thought he'd put to bed the, the threat against his kingdom in John's ministry. And now he hears that it's growing more abundant. It's, it's growing by leaps and bounds. His monarchy, his, his, uh, uh, his reign, his rule was founded on, on politicking with the Romans. Uh, his, his ancestors had politicked in such a way that this dynasty, the Herodian dynasty, was founded upon politicking with the Romans. And that was resented by the Jews, but he desired legitimacy with them all the same. In, in fact, Herod Antipas, who is the, the Herod that's uh, at play here in uh, Jesus' life and is the one who we'll, we'll see again at Jesus' crucifixion, he, he often, he even uh, removed his image from some of the coins in circulation in Israel because he, he knew that the Jews were offended by the, the making of a graven image. And so he, he was trying to appease the Jews and, and be seen by them and be legitimized by them to be their lawful king, to be the true king of the Jews. He wanted legitimacy in their eyes. He wanted the Jews to receive him as their rightful king. So then you can imagine when the rumors of this prophet from Nazareth, whose message was quite similar to John's, a call to repentance for the kingdom of God is at hand, whose message was that he was ushering in God's kingdom, restoring Davidic, the Davidic kingdom, this was frightful news to the puppet king. Couple that with the fact that there's wondrous signs backing up his claims, and he's gathering ever-growing crowds that are following him. And you have a terrifying combination for this pretender king. His grasp upon the kingdom is compromised. One other thing is worth pointing out, and that is that this message of repentance that the disciples are sent out to preach is always a politically and culturally potent one. This message of repentance goes out, and what that means, what that infers to the powers and principalities of earth and hell, the, the earthly rulers, what this infers, this call to repentance, and what it always does throughout even, even after Christ, now in the, in the age in which we live, this infers, this call to repentance that we as the church have been given, it infers to the world and to earthly rulers that there is a moral authority above our kings and constitutions. And this, as we see in our own day, causes a visceral reaction for the proud of heart. The call to repent and obey the gospel, obey God's word, live in accordance with God's word, turn from your sins and turn to Christ, turn to God's word, Yahweh's word, is going to be met with visceral reaction from those who have a, a, are proud in heart. Because what it says is that you're in defiance of God Almighty. 
You are walking in rebellion to the God who made you. And guilty consciences are haunted with the fear that their sin will be made known. Their sin will be published on the nightly news. Their sin will be revealed before all the earth, and it might trend on Twitter. And so, repentance is offensive. Repentance is offensive to the proud man. While Mark has been doing a great deal of helping us to look forward, to to see what lies ahead for Jesus, he now helps us and, and turns our eyes to look back at Israelite history to show us that Herod and Herodias stand in a long line of tyrant royal families. Mark calls to to our mind the story of Ahab and Jezebel persecuting Elijah and the other prophets of their day. If you remember the story of Ahab and Jezebel, one of the central um, uh, evils that they perpetuated was was that of killing the prophets of the Lord. And remember that uh, certain of them had been hidden away by the the, the servant Obadiah. He'd hidden several of them away, and that uh, that was a righteous action on his part, and Elijah praises him and commends him for it. But remember that Ahab and Jezebel are on a mission to kill and wipe out the righteous, to, to, to persecute and martyr righteous and faithful Israelites in their day. They hunt for uh, Elijah. They, they seek his death. And, and, and Mark wants us to call to mind that sort of persecution of the righteous in, and, and compares for us Herod and Herodias comparing them and, 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 and drawing our minds to see them as a New Testament Ahab and Jezebel. Herod's conniving wife, Herodias, had beguiled him into beheading John. Herod's conclusion to the success of the disciples' ministry is remarkably insightful. This phony king, this wicked king, saw more clearly than most Jews did. He concludes in the success of the disciples' mission that some sort of resurrection had taken place. And that might strike us as odd. Why would this Gentile king, this wicked king, this politicking king, this corrupt king, why would it be in the back of his mind that there was such a thing as a resurrection awaiting, coming down the pike, that that would threaten such kings? Jesus, we know, had come to bring about the Old Testament promises of life from the dead. Look at the story of the Old Testament. And all the prophets and wise men had foretold that when Yahweh would come to restore Israel, it would be like life from the dead. Job, ancient Job, had had, pro- had foretold the resurrection, even in the midst of all of his sufferings that seemed unjust to him. And he says, I know that my Redeemer lives and will stand upon the earth and I will see him with my eyes. Elijah and later Elisha, their ministries were marked by resurrections of the dead. At least three instances of it in Elijah and Elisha's ministry. These uh, archetypal prophets of the Old Testament demonstrate that the righteous, that, that these righteous prophets have the power to raise the dead. And so the Ahabs and Jezebels ought to be biting their fingernails in light of the fact that this power is, is, is found in the faithful, in the righteous. The united voice of the Old Testament prophets foretold the resurrection along with the sign of judgment it would be upon the wicked. Just one instance of it is in Isaiah uh, chapter 26, verses uh, 19 and, and um, verses 19 through 21. Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust, those who are dead, awake and sing, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. This is the restoration of Yahweh's kingdom, that the the earth would give up its dead. And Isaiah continues, come my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself as it were for a little moment until Yahweh's indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. 
These earthly rulers who had persecuted and killed the righteous are haunted by the fact that the Lord will come in vengeance and injustice, coupled with a promise of resurrection. The Lord would come out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity of shedding innocent blood. And so, all of this looms in the background of Herod's mind. It haunts Herod. What if righteous John had gone down into the grave? And if he had gone down into the grave and had now come out of the grave, what if he had gone down there into the grave, returned with divine powers along with other righteous witnesses from the grave? What if this John, who I had killed and slain unjustly, has returned to accuse me of my unrighteousness? Now remember that a key phrase throughout Mark's gospel is the phrase to make straight. That's how he began this. And we see once more that in the recounting of John's martyrdom, we see that word appear once more. Herodias' daughter, after conspiring with her mother, goes straightway to make her wicked request, and Herod immediately grants it, though grudgingly. Remember, that word shows up time and time again to, to give a sense of the immediacy and the speed at which all these events are transpiring and all of them being in Yahweh's hand, guiding and directing the, the, his purposes through all the twists and turns of God's story. The persecution of the righteous is not an impediment to God's purposes, but is the way in which he catches the wicked in their own net. And this will be made most abundantly clear in the Lord Jesus' death. They're conspiring. They're, they're their intrigues, their desire to cut down the voice of the, of the righteous will be thwarted. Had the demon powers and earthly rulers known, they would not have put to death the Lord of glory, Paul teaches us in 1 Corinthians 2.8. This was precisely the trap that God was setting. Her Herodias' daughter, Herodias and, and Herod, are conspiring to cut down the righteous. But in all of this, this is accomplishing Yahweh's purposes to establish his kingdom. And this will be made most evident in the life and death of Jesus. God purposed that all injustice, here is God's answer to our question at the beginning of how is God going to make all these wrongs right? How will God render justice to unjust men? Here is God's purpose, that all injustice and evil will be brought upon himself. God designed into the councils of eternity to send forth his son in the flesh to take all evil upon himself, to endure the, afflicted, the affliction of the curse, in order that he might take all that evil and injustice into the grave and leave it there. And in so doing, he would establish in his rising his universal rule of righteous judgment upon all the earth, upon the whole earth. Beginning with Cain, the wicked have persecuted the righteous. So God sent his son in the flesh so that the wicked could unleash all their injustice, indignity, and hatred of righteousness down upon his head. This persecution of the righteousness of, of the righteous that we see in the, the martyrdom of John is anticipating the worst injustice that will ever take place, the cutting down of God's own son the righteous Son of God, Jesus Christ. And all injustice, all evil, all indignity, the curse of the law will be brought upon Christ's own head. And this is how God will vindicate his righteousness. And now, their kingdoms, the kingdoms of wickedness, are all being overthrown by the increase of Jesus' righteous government in all the earth. If a man who is righteous who is innocent, truly innocent, unlike all the, all the righteous men in the Old Testament who were faithful men, but they were still sinful. In the life of Jesus, in the person of Jesus, we have the only truly innocent and righteous man. If a righteous man is cut down by the wicked powers of earth and hell, and he goes down into the grave, and he rises again by the power of God, that man gets to rule the world. Those are the rules. He gets to rule the world with his justice and his peace, with his standard of righteousness. And so the earthly kings are right to fear a man rising from the grave. Herod is right to be haunted by the prospect that John would arise again. For indeed, John, who is a faithful man in Christ, will be raised again to accuse Herod of his unrighteousness. And so all of this shows why the resurrection is the certain hope of the meek, while at the same time being a holy terror to the wicked. How does God 
deal with your suffering? How does God look at the, the miseries and the anguish that you endure? Well, here's how. He takes it upon himself in the person of his beloved son. He takes all of your misery, all of your suffering, and Christ took it upon himself. He was a suffering servant. The, the grief that was upon him, the, the, the wounds that were placed upon him, he's borne it all for us. He takes upon himself our sufferings in the person of his beloved son. How does God then deal with wicked men? What should the tyrants and wicked men of every age be, be confronted with? How, does God, how will God deal with them? Well, first of all, he patiently calls them to repentance. How did John land in hot water anyway? Well, it was by calling Herod to repentance. God is patient with the wicked, but his justice will win in the end. Yes, God patiently calls them to repentance, but the resurrection is a warning to wicked men. It's a, it's a warning to tyrants. It's a warning to those who insist on maintaining their way of doing things, their wicked way of doing things, whether they be great or small. It is a warning to those who will not repent and insist upon being king and sovereign of their life. The resurrection is a warning of judgment. Ahab and Jezebel will soon face Elijah before the judgment seat of the risen Christ. Herod and his conniving wife will soon be confronted with John the Baptist who will be raised with Christ his Lord. All evildoers will be brought to justice. It's quite interesting that Herod here is fearful of these reports of Jesus and the success of the disciples' mission. This, this band of mighty men driving out wicked and summoning Israel to repentance haunts Herod, and he concludes that a man has risen from the, risen from the grave. And what's striking is that he saw more clearly than the, than the, earth, than the, than the Jewish leaders did. He saw what would actually happen in Jesus' own resurrection. Remember the story of Jesus in, Matthew, in the, in the go, uh, Gospel of Matthew, that when Jesus rose from the grave, many righteous men were raised with him. Christ went down into Hades, and he brought back with him all the righteous. And now the promise for us is this, that if you are in Christ, when Christ went down into the grave, you too might rise with him. We sang it just a minute ago. This is the great work which Christ our Messiah has brought about. Ye choirs of New Jerusalem, your sweetest notes employ. The paschal victory to him, the paschal victory to him in strains of holy joy. How Judah's lion burst his chains and crushed the serpent's head and brought with him from death's domains and brought with him from death's domains the long imprisoned dead. From hell's devouring jaws the prey alone our leader bore. His ransomed hosts pursue their way where he has gone before. Triumphant in his glory now his scepter ruleth all. Earth, heaven, and hell before him bow and at his footstool fall. While joyful thus his praise we sing, his mercy we implore. Within his palace bright to bring and keep us evermore. And so all glory to the Father be, all glory to the Son. All glory, Holy Ghost, to thee, while endless ages run. The resurrection is a certain sign that God will answer the martyr's prayers because Christ suffered the curse, suffered the indignity, suffered the misery of mankind in his sin, suffered our, the weight of our sin and transgressions upon himself. He became the curse so that we might be called righteous. He took it all upon himself and went into the grave and he liberated the prisoner. He liberated the chains of Hades, that the righteous might rise with him, that all who trust in him might be raised with him to eternal life. The resurrection is this certain sign that God will answer the martyr's prayer. How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And so Easter ought to be a holy terror to tyrants, great and small. Tyrants who insist on keeping their sin hidden, and not repenting of it. Tyrants who insist on persecuting the righteous and the faithful and the godly. Easter is a holy terror because Jesus Christ 
Yahweh in the flesh went down into the grave after suffering in our stead and emerged victorious with life eternal. So I want to ask yourself this. What is the worst thing you've ever done? For those who have repented and come to Christ, Jesus has taken that sin into the grave and left it there. And in his rising, you can be assured that you are counted as righteous in him. Now, what's the worst thing that's been done to you? What misery have you endured at the hands of others? What persecution have you endured from wicked men? The good news holds steadfast. Jesus rose from the grave, and you can be certain that the judge of all the earth will judge rightly when he comes one day in all his glory to judge the living and the dead. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for the righteousness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that by his death and burial and resurrection, we are now delivered from the chains of death and hell. They've been burst asunder that we might live eternally with you. We thank you for the truth that the resurrection brings to wicked men, great and small, near and far, that their throne, their empire will be cast down and the gospel of repentance and righteousness in Christ will spread throughout all the earth that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover, the wor- will cover this world as water covers the sea. And so now, Lord, we rejoice to pray back to you the words that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray, saying, The old story is true as ever. It is true as bread, as true as wine. The story of Christ risen from the dead is as familiar as the sunrise and as miraculous as the sunrise. This story is true, and it is the bedrock on which all other stories are built. Christ is sent into the tomb and is rising again triumphant on the third day is true like bread is true. It is solid, real, potent. It does something to you. Consider what the bread does. After it dies and dies and dies, it is broken for you and then it is passed from hand to hand like the word of Christ passed from person to person. And it is taken in and turns to the stuff of life. There are many things you could eat, just as there are many stories you could listen to, but only one story gives you life. Do not gnaw on rocks when you could have bread. Christ's death on the cross and his glorious return beyond hope or expectation is true like wine is true. It is strange and surprising and dark and full of sweet vitality. It does something to you. It warms and cheers The grapes are crushed and left to wait, and then the wine is poured out lavishly, and it is passed from hand to hand like the glad news of deliverance, and it is taken in and turns to the stuff of joy and strength. There are many things that you could drink, but most of them would kill you. There are many stories you could take in, and unless they are derivatives of the great story, they are poison. But the story given to us is true. It is so true that it stretches forth its potency through two millennia to reach you here. The same Christ who died and rose again now offers you bread and wine. He offers you himself. Take in this story, for it is the bedrock of your life. Eat it like bread, drink it like wine, and tell it again and again to one another. Pass it from hand to hand. Give it to your children that they may grow strong. Offer it to those who are gnawing on rocks. So come in faith and welcome to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Almighty God, we do not presume to come to your table trusting in our own righteousness, but we come joyfully, boldly, again and again, trusting completely in the merits of Christ. We come to gratefully receive from Christ this bread, his body broken, and this wine, his blood shed on our behalf and for our restoration. In Jesus' name, amen. The certainty of the resurrection is a truth which haunts the tyrants, great and small. And so the charge is this. Ask yourself the question, is the resurrection, which we celebrate today, is the resurrection my vindication or my damnation? For the humble and repentant, Christ's resurrection is your vindication, for you are complete in him, and he counts you righteous in him. But for the proud and haughty, the resurrection is their damnation. And so ask yourself that question, is the resurrection my vindication or my damnation. And so now here with believing hearts and open hands, the benediction of God our Father, 
The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon and remain with you always. And amen. Amen.